Oh. Oh, no, I hadn't heard, but. That's that's horrible. I um, you know, we live out in the woods. I never hear anything. There's there's a zillion little ponds out there. That's that's a shame. Well, thank you for that cheerful news. <laughs> All right. Now that we've got that. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you comfort the family whose mother drowned, that you give them peace, give them assurance that your will, Father, you knew when and why and how this was going to happen. I pray, Father, for the family that was terrorized by the person that came into their home. Father, it's, it's a feeling that most never have to experience, but when you do, it's a terrifying one. Pray for them, Father. I pray for the message today, Father. You'll give me the words, the wisdom, and I may tell what you would have me say, not what I would have me say. pray that in Jesus' name, his holy name. Amen. I love the story of Lazarus. Now, when you think about it, it's kind of sad in a way. A good friend of Jesus, a beloved friend of Jesus dies, and Jesus kind of spins his wheels for a while like he doesn't care. Okay, just, hey, okay. Finally, he goes over several days later. And the sisters are there, and they're pretty upset with Jesus and said, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so we get into this whole message, but what I like about it is, Lazarus points out, someone who was dead is now alive. And that's really the key to Christianity. We get the story of Lazarus, and it comes in part from the very last part of our, our creedal form, we call it the Apostles' Creed, but this was our baptismal uh, utterance for the apolox, uh, as, uh, aspala, asp the faith. <laughs> you know, English is a tough language. We have the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Do you happen to remember where you've seen that? The very last sentence of the Apostles' Creed that we just said. It's not in very big letters, is it? Well, how that came about is, historically, they did baptisms on Easter. It was a big time to baptize for many reasons. One, the weather was usually pretty good, but it was very symbolic. And they just saved up the baptisms for then. We're so anxious that if somebody comes forward, we'll try to baptize them the same day anymore. But back then, there was a process. And folks, there ought to be a process today. But... They had to recite certain tenets of the faith. They had to know the core teachings of the gospel before they could be baptized. Candidates were asked to confess their sin in response to three questions. The first question was, do you believe in God the Father? The answer is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, okay, creator of heaven and earth. That was the response to that one. The next question was, do you believe in Jesus Christ? The response should be, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended uh, to the dead. On the third day, he arose again, ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to, again to judge the living and the dead. And the third question was, 
Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. We call that the Apostles' Creed. We say that every week, every single week. But do we actually look at what the Apostles' Creed is telling us or what we're saying by it? The message today is living into our baptismal faith. Living into. The phrase that begins each of the articles of um, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in God. That starts it off. A better translation might have been, I believe in two. I believe in two. Believing in two someone means entrusting one's life to someone. So when I believe into God, I'm trusting my life to God. When I believe into Jesus Christ, I'm trusting my life to Jesus Christ. When I believe into the Holy Spirit, I'm trusting my life to the Holy Spirit. What each article of the Creed is really asking is not whether we have an intellectual knowledge, ideal, or example of God that created everything. Not asking us if we believe there is a God. That's a given. That's a given. The real question is, is whether we're prepared to entrust our lives to God, who in three persons united. And each part of the creed reaffirms that we are. I'm believing in two the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. I am believing in two the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Well, you might say, well, I don't know that I fully understand that. It even gets tougher was, how would you explain believing in two something to a non-believer? We had the, the Jewish man at the, the family get together. How would you explain believing in two Jesus Christ to a Jewish man who does not recognize that Jesus Christ has already came, that he's waiting for the Messiah still? He's still waiting for the promise. Uh, how would you explain it to a Muslim? That, that does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? How would you explain it to an, an atheist, you know, an agnostic? How would you explain it to people who just flat haven't thought about it and probably don't care? How would you explain believing in two? What examples would you give? What could you tell them about your own life that would show that you have believed in two God, in two Jesus Christ, in two the Holy Spirit? Can you, do you have examples of that? I can give you many examples of my failures. I don't have quite as many of my successes of believing in two. I think most lives are like that. Sometimes we have a hard time coming up with a good example in our life that we can share. Hopefully that will change after today. In John 11, 36 and 37, Jesus asks a similar question to Martha. He says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. She was believing into Jesus Christ as the Messiah. She was very specific in that. We have to be specific in our answers to people, in our questions to people, and in our life before people. What does it mean that you're believing into the resurrection? Resurrection of the body, believing into life everlasting. What's that mean? Well, for some people, the power of the resurrection is just a literal interpretation of it. Someone was dead, now they're alive for eternity. It's a pretty simple answer. Well, here are some statements. I believe Jesus Christ raised Lazarus, who had been dead in a tomb for four days, back to life. I believe that to be true. I believe Jesus was physically raised from the dead. I believe that to be true. I believe I will be raised from the dead too. That's what it means to be saved. I believe that too. 
I believe I'm going to be raised with Jesus and united with my dead family members and people I love. I believe that too. These are all true. These are all wonderful. These are all great things. But there's more. If that's as far as you go, you're not living into the gospel. There was a pastor friend of mine in Tennessee that spoke on this very subject. I looked at what he said, and I paraphrased it, but I could not add to it or do it better, so I just simply am going to tell you what he said. And he spoke about seeing the resurrection of the dead in his family, in people he knows, and in his own life. Raising with Jesus means more than the possibility of going to heaven to reside eternally with God when our time's up on this earth. There's more to it than that. Resurrection is a daily opportunity to reclaim that we are the children of the living God. We overcome death every single day. That's the true resurrection. He spoke of those that he knew that, and loved who battled daily with addiction. People who cannot, no matter how much they want to, kick the habit. And yet, in the midst of their own repeated failures, they believe there's hope living into the resurrection. They trust in Jesus Christ. They live into the resurrection. They have hope. And that's what God tells us we have to have, hope. They're living into the resurrection by living with the hope and the promise that they will, by God's grace, be set free from the sickness that is death, the addiction, the drugs, the alcohol, many other addictions. The fact is, they live in the hope that they will be made new. We call it born again. Jesus Christ said, unless a man be born again. Well, they live in that hope of the res into the hope of the resurrection to be made anew. People who are fighting daily to overcome their addictions and problems are living into the hope of this resurrection that Jesus is talking about. One part of the 12 step program tells us that no one is recovered, rather we are all in recovery. That's true. None of us is done. We're all working towards perfection. We're not perfected on this earth. I will die imperfect. I will die with more failures than successes. I will die and be lost except for the blood of Christ. We just sang about the power of the blood of the Lamb. That's the only thing that will save my failures. That is living into the resurrection. We are overcoming by believing that there's a power greater than ourselves. Now, there are some people that like to call it a greater power. I call it God. God is my greater power. Jesus Christ is my greater power. The Holy Spirit is my greater power. Many, many are believing into the resurrection of Christ. We believe that in Christ all things are possible because Christ says in him all things are possible. If we see the resurrection is only something that happens after we die, we miss out on living the resurrected life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. Jesus says, I am. Not, I will be. He says, I am. This isn't a future promise. This is a, a statement of the status that he's currently in. I am the resurrection and the life. If it was a future event, he would say, when you die, I will be your resurrection. He doesn't say that. He says, I am. But yet, we have a hard time believing that sometimes. Encounters with God are always personal, spiritual, and emotional. 
If you don't encounter, if you don't encounter God in a personal way, if you don't encounter God in a spiritual way, and if you don't encounter God in an emotional way, you might want to look back on the encounter and see if it was just gas. Because I'm going to tell you right now, when you encounter God, there is no doubt about it. I wish I encountered God more than I encountered God. Jesus tells Martha her brother will rise again. Then he asks her if she believes in the resurrection. Her first answer was a general answer. She said, I know that it will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Do you believe your brother will rise? Yes, I know. He's going to rise again on the resurrection on the last day. He's going to be in heaven. I know that. That's not what Jesus was asking her. Her response only becomes specific when Jesus turns the conversation into a personal experience. It changed from general knowledge to a holy encounter. We all have a general knowledge, but do we have holy encounters? I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha, after this personal encounter with the holiness of Jesus, could only let what was in her heart flood out. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Yes, yes, Jesus, I believe you. Yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, yes, I'm believing into you. Not, I'm believing about you. I'm not believing what's going to happen. I'm believing into you. Yes, I am believing in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. For me, the power of believing into the resurrection is found in love. I find God in my encounters with love. As most of you are aware, I spent many years working around some pretty unlovable people. And my very first prayer and my very first sermon in a church from a pulpit was to pray that God softened my heart because my heart was about as hard as a rock. I asked that God, and he's worked on it. It's not there yet. <laughs> Probably never get to where I want it to be, but he works on it. The miracle of love, the miracle of being loved, the miracle of people choosing to love, the miracle of me choosing to love instead of hate. Jackie and I were having a talk about times 30 years ago or 40 years ago, and we both agreed that most of the time I lived on the edge of being dangerous. I did not have love, per se. I love my family, and I love people that love me, but I didn't, I didn't love the people that didn't love me. I didn't love the people that tried to hurt me. I didn't love the people that would try to kill me. I do now through God. I find that to be such an amazing miracle of the resurrection of who I was and who I am. I'm amazed at the rebirth. I have a story I can tell about living into the resurrection. My story is I'm not who and what I was. I am who God has made me and working on perfecting me and getting me a little better. It's overwhelming that God would love the world, that God would love me personally so much that he would give his only son. He would give his only son for whoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's um, overwhelming to me that God would do that for anyone. There are many people much nicer and much better than me. It amazes me he would do it for anybody, much less me. What does it mean that you're believing into the resurrection, into the body and life everlasting? Well, let me ask you a question. Those of you that are saved and been baptized, you made a baptismal covenant with the Lord. When you were baptized, now, that could have been recently, could have been a long time ago. You may have a clear memory, you may not have a clear memory. 
But you made a covenant with God when you were baptized to become a child of God. Are you ready to live that covenant? Are we prepared to renew our commitment today to the vows that you've made? The vows that you find in the Apostles' Creed that you say every week. Are you ready to start living that? Or do you just intellectually acknowledge it? Because if you live into the resurrection, we live into Jesus Christ. As we play our closing hymn,